this story is told through the eyes of three West Virginia veterans who stood up to communism on the battlefields of Korea. On Sunday, June 25th, communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. This attack has made it clear beyond all doubt that the international communist movement is willing to use armed invasion to conquer independent nations. An act of aggression such as this it creates a very real danger to the security of all free nations. Korea, after World War II, um, fell under control of the U.S. and Russia. And it, to kind of keep the peace in the Korean Peninsula, an arbitrary line was drawn at the 38th parallel to divide Korea, which was intended to be a temporary division. In 1950, the U.S. was in an economic downturn Jobs for fighting age males were far and few in between as business owners feared their workers getting drafted into the military. Uh, I came home and told my mother, I said, well, I'll be leaving tomorrow. And she said, what? And I said, well, I just joined the Army. So I joined uh, on November the 15th, 1948, knowingly because I hadn't found a job and couldn't get a job. On April the 12th, 1950, I enlisted in the United States Army. There was nothing here for me. I, I didn't finish high school, and I thought maybe that if I went in the military, I could further my education. I graduated in 1950. Well, you know, the, the war started on the June 25th, 1950, a day I'll never forget. But I couldn't get a job. Nobody wanted to hire me because I was draft bait. So I, I applied at a couple places, and they said, uh, Mr. DiCarlo said, uh, we'd like to hire you, but you're draft bait. You're going to be gone in another three or four months in the military. I put up with that for about a year and a half, and then I said, to hell with this, I just joined. North Korean troops stormed across the border um, at the 38th parallel and launched a massive offensive into South Korea, which pushed U.S. forces back and South Korean forces all the way back to the Pusan perimeter. As the North advanced rapidly, U.N. forces dug in to make their first stand to turn the North Korean army back. The United States prepared for war. I hadn't had any furloughs, so I took a 30-day uh, leave of furlough. And while I was home on furlough, I got a telegram stating, return to Fort Lewis immediately, commanding general. The war had broke out. Orders had already been cut for me to go to Alaska to be in some type of a, a cold weather battalion testing equipment and clothing. Right about the time I finished basic, the Korean War broke out in June of 1950. And of course, my orders were immediately changed. My class of, um, there were 62 guys in the class. They split the class in half. My half, all of the volunteers went to Korea and the draftees went to Germany. My buddy who was in the other class, they when they flipped the coin, he went to Germany and the other ones went to Korea, so we got split up. I, I, I ended up in Korea as a matter of a flip of a coin, me and all the other volunteers. By um, July, the, the independent South Korea essentially ceased to exist with the ex exception of the, the perimeter, which was about a 100 by 50 mile um, little corner. The actual uh, perimeter was contested and fought when U.S. forces under General Douglas MacArthur sent reinforcements into that region to, to hold the perimeter. And the idea was that the perimeter would be the kind of the last, um, the last gasp to try to save South Korea. As U.N. forces fought fiercely to defend the perimeter, Sergeant Hill was among the U.S. military preparing for the initial assault against a vicious onslaught of the North Korean Army. Through the towns we had firing missions and uh, uh, we ran in. We actually didn't have, meet any personnel of the enemy at all except through the field artillery that we were firing. And uh, at that time, uh, everything broke out of Pusan. As the U.S. drove the enemy back from the Pusan perimeter, General Douglas MacArthur spearheaded the second front on the western side of the peninsula that cut the enemy off on all sides. In late August of 1950, General Douglas MacArthur, who was um, commanding UN forces in Korea, 
devised a plan to relieve the forces fighting in the Pusan perimeter and to try to recapture South Korea up to the 38th parallel at least. And he came up with the idea of an amphibious landing at Incheon, which is in the um, mid western portion of Korea, just south of the 38th parallel. And um, that assault took place on September 15, 1950. The latter part of August, we boarded a ship in Yokohama, Japan, and we knew nothing about where we were going until the day before we landed at Incheon on September the 15th. And my regiment, the 31st Infantry Regiment of the 7th Infantry Division, drove south and our first objective was to take the walled city of Suwon. In September 1950, in the meticulously planned and flawlessly executed landing at Incheon Bay, the U.S. landed 75,000 troops and began to push south to meet up with friendly forces. Well, we, we continued to drive south and trap the North Korean soldiers in between the forces that were coming north from Pusan. The idea was to crush the North Korean army in a pincer movement with a breakout coming from the Pusan perimeter and then eventually forces at the Incheon landing um, and they would meet up and, and defeat the enemy. And um, ultimately it, it worked. It worked extremely well. It was a brilliant um, strategic victory for um, the UN and for the US. The victories at Pusan and Incheon Bay set the stage for re-establishment of the 38th parallel and the liberation of South Korea. MacArthur was not wanting to stop at the 38th parallel, however, and he did not. He kept the offensive going. We got to the 38th parallel, and through the 38th parallel, we waited three days before they decided that we were going to cross in, into uh, North Korea. Ultimately, Chinese forces got into the fight and they would attack from across the Yalu River in North Korea, the border between North Korea and China, and begin pushing UN troops and our forces back first to the 38th parallel and then um, push them even farther south. As the Chinese army began to push United Nations troops back with overwhelming numbers, our forces fought for their lives against both the enemy and the fierce Korean winter. At that time, it was very, very cold. We had no winter equipment. We had just the field jackets, the regular combat boots and so forth. And uh, we fought the, that's when the Chinese came across and we fought them for about 23 days there, just from one position to the other. Large numbers of United Nations troops suffered through frostbite and mass waves of enemy forces, including fierce night attacks carried out by the Red Chinese Army as temperatures dropped below zero. There were so many of them, and I understand, they, they said they were just like ants and the infantry, and the people said that there wasn't any way that they could stop them. And they just fire and uh, run out of ammunition, drop back, and, and run out of ammunition, drop back. They just kept coming. But how in the heck did 200 and some thousand people get across that line? And they, they said that they camouflaged during the day and traveled at night. They went 23 days without boots, cold weather, cold feet. Uh, we tried to get uh, tents. We, we used some parachutes at the the uh, parachute that they had dropped uh, made a drop and we had got some of this that we made kind of tents to help keep us warm. Finally they gave us the word to pull out and when we pulled out they said the position was overrun probably within about one minute after. And during this time at cold weather at Ensign, I was there 23 days, I didn't shave, change clothes, and whatever. I got, got my feet frostbit and whatever. And they kept saying, well, why didn't you go to an aid station? And I said, there wasn't any aid stations because everything was set so, so under so stress and, and, and fighting, everybody fighting, that there wasn't any time for it. While the Western Front was being overrun, UN troops sailed from Pusan up the eastern coast to head off the enemy at what would become the Battle of the Chosan Reservoir. 
sometime in October, we made it to Busan, South Korea, and immediately they loaded us on ships again and uh, kept us there a few days and uh, reissued ammunition and, and what have you and replaced what men we had lost. And uh, we went up the east coast of Korea. We landed at a place called Iwan, North Korea, just south of the Yalu River, the border between China and North Korea. After we drove north, uh, I think we made it almost to the Yalu. And then we got orders to pull back. We had Thanksgiving dinner in reserves, and of course it was well below zero. And as far as I can remember, when we went through the mess tent to get the food, outside it immediately froze over. And we took it back to our bunkers up in the hills and thawed it out and ate it. And they told us then that MacArthur had sent word that we would be home by Christmas. And on the 27th of November, they brought in a, a, a lot of two and a half ton trucks for transport. But before we got on the trucks, they issued a lot of ammunition. And instead of going south, they took us north to a little town called Kotori, North Korea, about 11 miles below the Chosin Reservoir. And our job was to open up the roadblocks, which they told us at the time that were North Korean. We knew nothing about the Chinese at the time. As our forces struggled to keep communications open between units on the opposite coast, the Eastern Front was caught by surprise by massive Chinese army numbers. The Chosun Reservoir became an all-out fight to the death. We jumped off about eight o'clock in the morning to, uh, to open up these roadblocks. And of course, right away, we ran into thousands of Chinese. My company on the day of the 29th and, uh, and the night of the 29th and into the morning, early morning hours of the 30th of November, we lost approximately 100 men. About 12 o'clock on, on the 29th, I got a small shrapnel wound in my back and uh, while trying to knock out a machine gun nest, which we eventually did, they loaded us back on trucks after we knocked the machine gun nest out on the, on the hill. And about five o'clock that evening, uh, the Chinese just blocked everything. I mean, they set the first vehicle on fire and the last vehicle in the convoy on fire. And uh, sometime just before dark, I got hit uh, with a, a submachine gun round. And I don't know the exact temperature, but they said it was about 32 below zero. And we had no, absolutely no winter clothing at all. We fought through the night and we were really scattered out. The Chinese had disrupted the convoy and, and we were really in a mess. About 4.15 on the, in the morning of the 30th, we got word that our company commander had surrendered the company to the Chinese. And I don't really know exactly how many men was with me on, on a little riverbank in the valley, but we had a, a commando officer with us. And he said, uh, they gave us an ultimatum to surrender. And he uh, told us, he said, listen, he said, uh, it's suicide to surrender. It's suicide to stay here and it's suicide to go. He said, every man for himself. And when he said that, I had a good friend that had been hit about five times with a submachine gun, but a light submachine gun. And uh, he had no bones broken or anything. And, and I asked him if he could, if he could move at all. He said, oh yeah, with a little help. I, can. I said, well, let's go. We left right at, right at the break of day and crossed a little stream and up on the hill and headed south. 
and ran into a Chinese patrol and we lost the, the lead man in the patrol. And when they opened up on us, we, we were probably maybe 150 yards up on the hill out of the valley. And we could see tanks about a mile down in the valley. And uh, so we decided to go back off and, uh, and try to hook up with those tanks. And uh, eventually we did. And I don't know how many men we lost on our way there, but uh, I remember getting pulled up on the back of a tank. And from there, I don't remember anything until I woke up in a, in a tent back at Coterie. Moving under cover of darkness, the Communist Chinese Army secretly surrounded U.S. forces at Coterie and began to attack from all sides. I found out later that at the time the Chinese had completely encircled the, the base at Coterie. And there was no way in or out. A pilot, he was a, a spotter for the artillery who had been a fighter pilot during World War II and shot down and, and uh, got with the French underground. He was a very brave man. They uh, took a dozer and made a, a small field, and pushed a railroad track out of the way and made a small field. And he flew 20 times in there and, and uh, flew 20 of us out, one at a time. His name was Lieutenant Lonnie Mosley. Lieutenant Mosley was awarded the Silver Star and went on to serve heroically in Vietnam. Regarding his heroic actions at Cho Son Reservoir, he was quoted as saying, if you can rescue a person who might die, that's not going to be on duty. That is duty. This lieutenant flew me to, to a place called Ham Hung, still in North Korea. And uh, they had a makeshift hospital in a school building. And they came around and they checked everybody and they said, uh, if you uh, are in shape, we're going to issue rifles and ammunition. And if you're not in shape, we're going to tag your, your cot and we're going to fly you to Japan to the hospital. So they flew me to Japan on about the 10th of December of 1950. We had uh, truckloads of frozen bodies, soldiers and Marines. And guys, when I got to the hospital in Japan, their feet were black, their hands were black, with cotton between their fingers and their toes. And I was in the hospital for a while and then to a, a recuperation place. And uh, they sent me back to Korea, back to my original outfit, B Company of the 31st Infantry, 7th Division. I stayed there until October the 5th of, of 51 and I can honestly tell you that I don't remember not one day. Due to the fierce fighting and the unique brutality of the Korean War, many troops mentally blocked out the horrific experiences they endured. Big engagements at Pusan, Incheon, and Chozan all took place in um, 1950. However, the war would continue until 1953. As the war carried on years longer, the fighting raged on with ferocious intensity. A stalemate had developed along the 38th parallel. I didn't have any combat boots. They didn't have size 12, you believe it? And I, I almost got in trouble with my feet, but luckily, um, I was able to get some help and uh, I didn't get, my feet weren't destroyed. And when I went on my first combat patrol at night, and uh, that's a pretty scary time to be out in front of the lines. My sergeant, I never knew what he thought about me until I went on a patrol, my first combat patrol. He checked me out. I had a bandolier here, a bandolier here, M1. I had two, if I remember correctly, two fragmentation grenades and two Willie Peters white phosphors and he took off he took his 45 off his belt and he gave it to me I said what are you doing he said if you get hit 
and, and you have one hand bad or whatever. He said, what are you going to do with that M1? He said, you got to take this 45. And he gave me his 45, which was really a treasure in the infantry. As fighting broke out on almost every surrounding ridge on the front lines, the long violently contested Pork Chop Hill turned into one of the bloodiest battles of the war. So we had an overstrength squad on that knob because the knob was so small, there wasn't more than 15, 20 guys on that thing. And uh, Sergeant uh, Pat, they told to evacuate the, the outpost because the enemy over, was overrunning. Could, they couldn't stop them. Too many numbers. And they pulled back a guy named Tyree that lives up here in Young's Bottom, was on a machine gun. And he stayed there while the guys bugged out to go 150 or 200 yards back to where we had some strength. And I went out there the next morning. Of course, there was no fire. Quiet. That's when I get, saw the dead soldier and, and, and uh, got my burp gun. I didn't get it, the South Korean. He says, you want that burp gun? I said, yeah. He went out there and tied a, they used to booby trap their bodies. And this guy was dead on the burp gun. Anyway, he got a combo wire and tied it around the trigger guard, got back in the trench, which was only this deep, and he pulled it out, and he got me, got me the gun. We went out on the outpost, in front of the outpost. Porkchop Hill is about 230 meters, about 500, four or 500 yards away was Baldy, and it was over 500 meters, and we're here, and the enemy's here, broad daylight. Thank God they didn't have a lot of ammo. And, uh, a guy named Tyree was on a machine gun on the outpost that night when we got hit. Tyree was hit and had, they said half the cheek of his butt was blown off. And he was bleeding to death, but the guy named Lothgren was the medic and he stayed with Tyree, kept him from bleeding to death. They overran the hill, they kicked Tyree he was half dead. He didn't make a sound. Lothgren didn't have a scratch on him. They kicked him and he made a sound and he murdered him right on the spot. He should have gotten the Medal of Honor, but the West Pointer that was our company commander got hit a couple, three or four days after I did and never put him in for it. No, nobody, nobody put him in for it. He gave his life to save Tyree's life. I don't know if he's living now or not. That West Pointer was the reason I got hit. So here's Pork Chop Hill. And we had three outposts, one over here, here, and here. Oh, a couple hundred yards. So I took a, I had a, a South Korean boy and a, a guy named Hendrickson from Michigan. We go up there, here's a machine gun bunker. Oh, I timed it. How long would it take us to jump through that aperture, put the legs out on a mortar, and drop a flare in within Seven, nine seconds, I don't remember. We had a round on the way. Well, hell, that's good enough. I didn't, I didn't want to stand out there like uh, targets. I'll be damned, the West Point commander came out. He said, what are you guys doing in that bunker? I said, we're on the flare gun, sir, for the outpost. He said, I want you guys standing out here in front of the bunker. So we got out and stood in front of the bunker. Me, George Hendrickson, South Korean, about three or four yards apart. We wasn't out there 15 minutes. One round and one round only. Fired at four or 500 yards. Landed six or eight feet from where I was standing. A 61 millimeter mortar round should have blown my head off. Why didn't it? It blew a hole in the ground that deep. I got hit with a bushel of dirt, but only about 100 pieces of shrapnel. Knocked me on my ass. Those other two guys were standing to my right. They never got a scratch because I was shielding them. I go to the MASH hospital. Ten days later, eight days later, here comes Hemp Hill in. I'm sitting down eating breakfast, eggs over, hemp, uh, bacon, whatever you want, a juice. Great, great food in the MASH hospital. Here comes Hemp Hill in the mess. He can't sit down to eat. He got hit in the ass. <laughs> he found out how cheap a purple heart was. <laughs> the West Pointer got it. After World War II, our Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals, or MASH, came to be the best in the world, 
countless of wounded troops owe their life to the heroes that served in these units. They didn't have x-ray equipment there in the MASH, in the MASH hospital. Uh, so they sent me to the Norwegian Evacuation Hospital because I had, well, I got hit with a bushel of dirt, but about 100 pieces of shrapnel all on my left side. <laughs> and uh, I get to the Norwegian Evacuation Hospital, which was 30 miles away, south, 40, I don't know. And they processed me, took x-rays, and uh, to see how much uh, they had left in me. I had a guy come in there in the, in the morning and uh, found out what happened. And he shaved me from here all the way down to my ankle with a razor blade, a plain razor blade. You know how many times he nicked me? None. He was a professional. I said, how long have you been doing this? He said, nine years. I said, but you're only a corporal. He said, I've been busted so many times I don't even remember. Then he took a two-inch paintbrush and dipped it in methylate and painted me from here all the way down. It was still a brutal campaign to be involved in and a terrible war that lasted until a truce was signed in 1953 between North Korea and South Korea. And to this day, there has been no permanent peace signed in Korea. So technically, the two Koreas are still at war with one another. After years of war, General Mark Clark, commander of the UN forces, finally brokered a ceasefire, which is still in place today. Troops celebrate the news of peace and the chance to get some much needed rest from the seemingly endless fighting. We have stopped the shooting. That means much to the fighting men and their families. And it will allow some of the grievous wounds of Korea to heal. Therefore, I am thankful. The task now is to put the ceasefire agreement into full effect and get down to working out an enduring settlement of the Korean problem. We had 54,000 killed Americans and 102,000 wounded. So it wasn't just a skirmish, it was a real war. Come back to my outfit, and within the next couple months, truce was signed. We moved back into garrison. Two months later, they sent me up before a review board, and uh, I got a waiver, and after 15 months in the Army being in the infantry and wounded and everything, and I knew what the hell I was doing, and I got promoted to E6 with only 15 months service. The guy said, my God, that takes 15 years. I said, if you're in the infantry and you stay alive, you get promoted. <laughs> after the fighting came to a halt, our battle-weary veterans returned home to try to find a new peace. We came back to West Virginia, and uh, I helped build all the interstate system through Charleston a lot of the bridges on the turnpike. Just worked. My family lived here. Uh, my folks lived in Weirton, in the same place, and, uh, and uh, I came home. I, t I came back to West Virginia because I was home. And six months later, I got married, and that's the end of my life. I mean, story. <laughs> Where have you been? Well, I've been to Korea. Well, where's Korea? Where you know, I mean, really, uh, I don't think my mother or my father, stepfather or any one realized that the danger I was really in. I mean, people didn't understand about the war in Korea. I guess I was treated well, uh, but like I said, a lot of people I said, well, where have you been? And I said, Korea, and where's Korea? You know, I mean, uh, so it, they call it the Forgotten War. Through the heroism displayed by these three veterans and countless others, the Forgotten War will never be forgotten.